Hi, everyone, and welcome to Meet the Forward 50. I'm Jody Rudoran, editor in chief of The Forward. We have three amazing guests today um, Alex Goldstein, Yael Eisenstadt, and Rami Evan Esh, better known as Kosha Dills. We are going to start off with a video of Kosha from our virtual gala uh, a couple months ago while people are rolling into the webinar. So just sit back for a second and enjoy this video. My name is Coach Hills. This is wow, I love. and this is our drummer, CJ. What's going on? CJ? Show your love. Show your love. So we're gonna do this little freestyle jam, what we created especially for you. And guess what? We're gonna do it right now. So hit it. So you're gonna put your hands in the air like this. Let's just like me and Wild Love do. You're gonna be on your home screen like this. Ready? And it goes like something like this. Hey, okay, when I yell forward, you say gala forward. Gala forward. Gala. When I say forward, you say gala forward. Gala forward. Gala. Kosha deals, believe in sin. I preach and win. One time for comedians and never rock so true. Hot for you. Hot old jewels never bomb on Zoom. I never want to be an alcoholic. I want to watch TV with my Indiolic. What do I call it? Hitting it wild. And then I kick it with my boy Go I Love. Why to the L O V E? You know me, one here. Still keeping 613 easy. The Jewish here only see me. And I be reading the F O R W A R D. The four words in Yiddish, English, whatever edition. I'm switching, I hit this, my vision, the tickle, and I'm seeing. And I know what the thing I be reading. Why uh. L O V E with Kosha? Know the style is going over the heads of readers of other publications. But the forward is here for the nation. When I yell forward, you say gala forward. Gala forward. Gala. When I yell forward, you be a rapper forward. Rapper forward. Rapper. I think about it, drink about it on. We go back and forth like ping pong. Hard to the core, onto the floor. I kick four and then you go back to four. Go back to four, four bars, four hard. Y'all don't be false at bars like solar energy. I know they ain't sweating me. Kosher, take it from the Y-L-O-V-E. Ecstasy, yes, it's me on patience. We love it when you guys give big donations. Wanna kick it? We cool forward rappers. Make some love to the forward gal. Forward gala, talking development, fundraising, and we ain't chasing nothing less than the highest donations. Community, show your love for all the unity. That's what happens when we go rhyme scene, and I don't. Okay, we're gonna get started in just a sec. If we can, thank you so much. Thank you, Gabby Brooks, for playing that video and for helping organize the webinar. Thanks also to Lisa Lepson and Dina Cooperman at the Forward for helping put this together and promote this. And thank you all for joining us. Uh, this is the second in our weekly experimental series of bringing members of our Forward 50 list that we publish every year. We're bringing them to you live for conversation about the things that they do and care about and also the things that you care about. And it's gonna be a, a, a free flowing conversation. Um, just a couple of notes about how we use Zoom on these events. Um, we welcome you to post in the chat any comments you have about what's going on, or I may throw a question out to the audience and ask you to just post your answers in the chat right now. If you want to say who, where you're dialing in from, that'd be great. And you should make sure to be posting to all panelists and attendees, not just panelists, because then other people won't see it. If you have a question that you'd like me to pose to our panelists, you should use the Q&A button, not the chat button. They're basically in the same place on the bottom of your screen if you're on a computer. And on the left, if you're on a phone or tablet, um, but that so so chat is for chatting and comments, Q and A for questions. And uh, before you ask the crucial question of whether or not we are recording this and whether you can get a video of it, the answer is yes. We will send you a video by email tomorrow, and in that email, you will also see a discount subscription offer from the forward. So we hope you'll uh, stay in touch with us and attend more of our events and, and read our great journalism. Um, as I said, this is a, kind of a new experiment we're doing this year. We have three great panelists who don't know each other, whose work has nothing to do with each other, who happen to be on the list we put together of the most interesting, remarkable, influential, important, uh, interesting Jews, American Jews of 2020. 
and we just put them together for this conversation. So we're going to hear a little bit about them individually and then see what happens when they talk to each other and talk to you. Um, I guess I'm going to introduce them one at a time and let them talk because that way we won't get overwhelmed. I'm going to start with um, Alex Goldstein, who, uh, like me, grew up in Newton, Massachusetts and actually went to the same high school, not at the same time. Alex uh, worked for a decade as a spokesman for Governor Deval Patrick, and then in 2016 founded a PR and communications firm called 90 West. Um, they don't sell shoes. Um, it's based on the Mass Turnpike is 90 from Boston out to the world, out to the West Coast. Um, and then, and he's been on the board of ADL. He's now on the board of the JCRC. He's worked with the Federation in Boston. He went to Brandeis. And he, uh, last year, at the start of the pandemic, found a, created a Twitter account called Faces of COVID to help chronicle the loss, the collective community loss. And, and sort of, I, well, I want to hear him tell us why and how he founded that um, and what it has been like to be experiencing and chronicling the pandemic in such a visceral, personal, human way. Um, so Alex, tell us a little bit about your 2020. Thank you so much uh, for having me on. I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks to the wonderful panelists of, of esteemed folks that I get to do this with. And the, uh, I don't know, it's a little intimidated coming on after that opening uh, freestyle. I'm gonna, I hope we're not asked to do that later or this is gonna get pretty badly mangled on my part. Um, but uh, again, yeah, really happy to be here. You know, in March, I think like a lot of folks, I was really struggling in the early days of the pandemic in terms of how to, uh, even kind of begin to grasp what was happening out there. I was here in Boston and like a lot of places on the on the East Coast, uh, we had a major surge very, very quickly and things got very bleak very fast. And one of the things that was abundantly clear was that these headlines that were cascading through our doom scrolling phones um, talked a lot about numbers, uh, but not a lot about real people. And I think for me, um, initially I started Faces of COVID as a means of processing uh, just the, the basic dignity of the people we were losing. What were their names? What were their stories? Uh, you know, I, I see myself sort of as a storyteller by trade. Um, and so to be able to uplift those stories was meaningful to me. And apparently a lot of other folks were looking for something like that too. And I think the second piece of it was really around accountability because to me, it became really clear in the earliest days of the pandemic that we had you know, horribly failed in our management of this catastrophe and that the consequences of that are in the names and faces of every single person that we're losing. And I think um, you know, throughout this process, as we now today reach 400,000 people lost uh, to COVID, that this is also a question of accountability. And I think each of these stories asks us an important question about what we could have done differently um, as a government, but also what we could have done differently in community to take better care of each other. Sorry, you've been doing this now every single day, basically for like nine months, right? My daughter was mentioning that it's been more than almost, I think it's been 300 days at least since we've been in this mode. And I guess I wonder, you probably thought it would be a few weeks or a few months and maybe it'd be a few hundred people. I don't think you, so how do you keep going and how, how many people have you done? And how do you deal with the, like keep going on this individual humanizing basis without being totally overwhelmed by the kind of unfinishability, if that's a word of the yeah. task. Yeah, I think uh, if you had told me in March that I would spend the next 10 months doing this every single day, late at night and early in the morning uh, is usually when I do the research and um, you know draft the posts and get everything scheduled and everything like that, I would have thought you were uh, a little bit losing your mind, but then he here we are. On, I'm actually entering month 11 of um, chronicling these stories and I do try to do it every day. It's sort of become this daily ritual that has become really meaningful for me. You know, it's, uh, I don't pretend that it's like an enjoyable experience to have to see day after day these stories. And, you know, so many of them now are submitted directly by families directly to Faces of COVID. We have a submission form that you can go to on the Twitter page. And um, so these are people sometimes was very common to get a story sent in the day of or day after somebody passed away. People are so isolated in this moment that having some kind of experience of a communal morning, even if it's a bunch of strangers you've never met replying to a tweet 
saying um, you know, that their loved one meant something um, has been you know, a really powerful experience. The one thing I will say though, is well, I, I appreciate that people feel like this is something extraordinary. And I think maybe doing it day in day out for this long a period of time is, you know, has got people's attention. I think the real reason people see Faces of COVID as an extraordinary platform is because of what's missing everywhere else, which is we really haven't found a way to mourn together at a time when there's just unspeakable loss happening in every corner of the country. And there's real consequences to not being able to do that together. And I think um, you know, having a meaningful way for me to engage has been actually very healthy for me as I've tried to sort of navigate this, this experience like everybody else. Great. Well, we'll get back, I'm sure, to talking more about that. I'm going to go now to Kosha Dills, who, of course, had his basic introduction by the video a minute ago. Um, and I don't know if we call you Kosha or Rami Evan S., uh, but uh, I, you know, Rami started rapping at the age of 17. He grew up in New Jersey. His parents are Israeli immigrants, and he's um, had you know a number of albums and just has been doing documentaries and videos and all sorts of stuff. He's very engaged on social media, and I, I guess what I want to start with you, and um, I guess at some point you're gonna have to tell us how you picked your name, but your rap name. But I, I want to start by by picking up from from you know Alex talked about his experience of like the world changing in 2020 and the pandemic kind of overwhelming him the way he responded. And I just, you know, for someone, for an artist, I just wonder how, how if you can bring us into your world of how as the pandemic set in, you changed your operations and, and both in terms of you had to shut down various things, touring, et cetera, but then also there's all these yeah. other ways of expressing and, and outlets in different artistic forms. So I wonder if you can take us a little bit through your pandemic experience and, and how things changed and, both negative and positive for you in 2020. Sure. Um, well, one, thank you for having me as part of a part of this, a true honor um, to be with so many as, uh, as the other panelists, I feel like are uh, so much so accomplished. And I'm like, oh, what do I do? I just rap. But um, it's a little bit more complex than that. Um, I came over for, I was living in Israel this past year, came over to do a tour. We were planned to, you know, tour through 30 cities, um, an album coming out and everything just sort of stopped. And and I do about 80 shows a year. So I was, when I, like most of my income comes from live events. So we switched um, and I started taking in um, just any way that I could stay engaged online. Um, one included uh, working with this nonprofit called Value Culture. It's based out of the Bay Area. We were doing a, we threw a Passover festival. We threw, uh, we, we started this thing called Soul Vey, which is black and Jewish events, which if you look at my South by Southwest event um, for the past six years, I bring Israeli bands together with gangster rap in America and indie culture and stuff. And that's basically what I did, but we, we rebranded it a little bit for the internet. And um, we just did an event with Martin Luther King's lawyer and Ari Melber from MSNBC, um, where I'm also performing and we're just sort of doing experiences. Um, to, to shift your your work, as, I think as an artist, I think you're always thinking of something to stay relevant. And if you don't do anything, um, everyone else is in the same boat. We all have to do something different. Like your uh, uh, newspapers, uh, magazines, television stations. So as much as we want to be, you know, pampered because we're artists and we need special treatment and no one cares about the artists, no one cares because everyone everyone's has less. We all have less whatever our art form is or whatever our expression is, wherever our job is. Um, and it's, and I'm the one who took the job. So I've actually ironically I've had more success online um, because I've been forced to figure out how to do it. Um, yeah, so, I feel like, you know, we've been talking about this a lot. It's been a, a recurring theme in our coverage and in some of our events of like, you know, there's a whole panoply of Jewish organizations, journalism organizations, artists, whatever some more innovative than others, more, more already innovating. And those that were either already innovating or really ready to innovate, I think really are thriving in this environment where there's so much access to different people and different opportunities. And then people who are close to innovation are still trying, just can't wait for the doors to reopen. But it, it does feel like there's a lot of, of new creativity happening that I hope carries over. Yeah, I, I would never think 
for for me, I think I'm, you know, in the last of the millennial age that is figuring out the internet and not and still very good in real life situations. <laughs> um, which is everyone's like, I wish you could play our event. And and so I had to figure out a way. So what can I do that's meaningful and impactful so that when this is all over, people said I gave more than I took. And I think, you know, when we're we took it for granted that, you know, you're pitching and pitching and pitching. And I'm so used to, you know, asking on tour. I think my work with the nonprofit during this time has sort of shifted my perspective of what's going to last me another 20 years. You know, as a musician, we think, no, we're just going to do music. And you know, now you're going to have to write television because people are watching online. So for me, I've, I've had to really think outside the box. But one, I think, you know, that I'm sure all the panelists would agree on is that this is a time that, you know, we're not the billionaires becoming billionaires. I think we're, you know, we could give a little bit more if we have, and we're going to be fine with a little bit less because I think we're as a collective and humanity, geez, we all have a little, everyone has less right now. Um, so that's been my, my idea and I've been more productive <laughs> um, I, at, during this time than, than other times. Cause if it was the other times- you were, really... you were actually living in Israel and just here on a visit and then got basically stuck here and you- Yeah, yeah, cause I, I didn't want to go back there. Yeah, exactly. So I was planning to come um, do my South by Southwest event is where I really go down in March. Um, I came to APAC um, at that time when I was leaving in the airport, we were, I went from Israel to Portugal. Um, and, you know, people were just starting to wear masks. It was like the first day yeah, of March. I was at you know, that exact so too. We were sort of making fun of the elbow bumps and yeah. Yeah. yeah and it was just like, it was a thing at that time. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. Like a long time um, ago. Yeah. Right, I want to bring you yeah, into the conversation. Yeah. Another daughter of Israelis or Israeli mother. Um, yeah. Yeah, Al was a CIA officer and a diplomat and worked in the White House for 18 years. And and uh, what I loved, to, <laughs> you know, I just interested, when we asked Yael for the best title for her, she said democracy activist, which has never seemed like a more relevant title than it does this month. Um, so after 18 years in government, she was concerned about the breakdown in civil discourse and went to work at Facebook in 2018. She was the head of Facebook's global elections integrity operations team, which it had just formed um, to monitor and control political advertising. But after I think about six months, Yale realized that she was not gonna be able to change the company from within. And so she's left and has been a, very, a leading voice, um, critical of Facebook and other social media platforms and a public advocate for transparency and accountability across the tech spheres. Um, and it's, she had a recent TED talk, which we'll share in a second about how social media is radicalizing us. Um, and she's really trying to get people focused on the solutions to this problem. And obviously 2020 was a very fertile year in the democracy, activism, tech accountability sphere. Um, and, and it only continues now. So I guess I'd love you to just talk yeah, about, great, you know, the, the, the news is so intense in your realm right now. So maybe talk a little bit about, um, you know, I guess I would frame the question as, do you think January 6th is some kind of turning point um, where the siege on the Capitol arrested us into some more deeper, clearer understanding of the dangers of some of the uh, discourse going on in the social media platforms, ways of organizing, um, and that things are going to change? Or do you think this is like, are we, are we, are we, where are we on the trajectory of this, if you can help us with that? Sure. Well, thanks so much for having me. Um, I, I should really start with the reason I keep looking off to the side and laughing is because my puppy chose this moment to be a complete spaz in the background. So you may hear some noise. I may bring him into the conversation at some point. Um, no problem. So I'll try to unpack this without giving a four hour long uh, journey here. Um, you know, January 6th, let's, let's start with that point. I think that is the point where many Americans who have known that there's, you know, that this is a bad situation, they've known that these tensions are out there, they know that, uh, I think it was a, for my world, which is really right now about accountability for how some of these companies are affecting our public square and democracy. I feel like it was a moment where there's no more arguing about whether or not um, social media does somehow bear responsibility. And the next question is now, what does that look like? 
And what's really interesting, I mean, it's kind of interesting that I'm paired up here with Alex because he's showing the positive way social media can really be used for good, for to connect people. And here you've got Kosha Dills, who's, it, it, I've got to assume social media is playing a really positive role in getting your music out there. And like there's, there's, I want to start with, those are the types of things that I believe these technologies were created for, right? To to make people feel connected, to make people be able to have some, you know, whatever, that's all of the positive. But years ago, I, you know, I spent most of my life focusing on work overseas and, um, and especially I started, I started in government before September 11th and then went down like many of us sort of this counter extremism path and did a lot of sort of heart to minds work overseas. Um, and that is really about understanding people and trying to help people early on who are on the cusp of being vulnerable to being radicalized and seeing if you can find common ground and trying to like help get to those people before it happens. And then in 2015, I started thinking, well, wait a minute, what's happening in the US actually is scaring me more than any of these issues. And started to think people were starting to be radicalized here at home. And so started looking at how social media plays into that. And, um, you know, I can answer questions if people want details, but the bottom line, which I see someone just posted my talk, and this is the topic of the talk, is that the way social media is currently designed and monetized, it is predicated on keeping our eyeballs on the screen, right? And in order to do that, it, it, the algorithms have figured out that the most salacious content, the most hate-filled, the most anger-filled, whatever gets an emotional reaction out of us, is what keeps us engaged. And so I, at the end of the day, some of these companies, Facebook in particular, have absolutely intentionally scaled to take over the entire global public square. But yet they don't feel that they should bear any responsibility. Oh, sorry, now there's a squeaky toy in the back. <laughs> What's his name? I tried so hard to call, to tire him out before this session. This is so awesome. I think I'll introduce amazing. him in a minute. I'll bring him on in a minute. But um, yeah, superstar. <laughs> but so they scaled to dominate our public square, but don't believe that they should bear responsibility as a as you know a guardian of that public square. And I think it's enough. I think time is very clear. Do I blame? I'll just leave it with this. Do I blame Facebook for the fact that Donald Trump? called for basically insurrection at the Capitol? No. Do I blame Facebook for the way that they have led so many people down conspiracy theory path, theorist paths, for the way they've actually connected people to conspiracy theory groups, for the way they've let hate speech not just thrive, but they've amplified it. Their algorithms have spread it. And this isn't, you know, here, this is the forward. How does that apply to us as Jews? I think that's pretty obvious. I mean, the growth in extremism, in hate speech, and what happens online does translate offline, as we saw in January 6th. So all my work right now is really focused on how should we define the rules of the road so that we can realign sort of government, democracy, and the technology industry for the greater good. That was like yeah. the most condensed I can get. I'm hearing no, you. I'm going to grab the puppy I mean, at the same time. Yeah, let's we'll, let's meet the puppy. Um, and I'm I mean I'm really glad that you said yeah. What what I was going to say yeah. about um, the way that oh god, so cute. What's his name? Can you take me seriously if he's in my hands? Totally. <laughs> his name is Brixton, and he's being a spaz right now. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Um, this is we're going to get to in a few minutes talking a little bit about what are things that have changed for us personally during the pandemic that we might want to take with us into the into the post vaccine world and maybe being with your puppy at work is one of them I don't know or maybe not um but I, I want to pick up on what you said at the beginning of, of your remarks of just of, of the ways in which you, we have right here on this call living breathing examples of people using social media platforms to build community um to grow businesses, um, to engage, you know, to inform and, and educate people and, and connect them, people of people who otherwise would never be able to be together and all the things that, that we thought they were supposed to be about. And yet, obviously, we've all been very face to face also with um, the dangers, the negatives. And I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure Kosha, for sure, I, I bet, and maybe Alex too, has also been, you know, targeted personally with anti-Semitic 
um, material on these same platforms as I have been. And I guess I just, now we're in this interesting moment in which um, we're finally seeing some of the follow through um, uh, in terms of crackdown from the platforms that I think ADL and other Jewish groups and other um, anti-hate groups have been really pushing hard for the ban of President Trump himself, um, various other things to crack down on, on Facebook groups that were organizing the militias before January 6th, et cetera. And then leading into the deplatforming of Parler from Amazon. And I, you know, it's hard to say this, but there's increasingly, I think, some pushback or concern of the other side of this, right? Which is where mm -hmm. are the guardrails for free speech? You know, what when does cracking down on what we all don't want, which is organizing a, an assault on our capital, start to encroach on Alex's ability to do this amazing community building. And I, I guess I'll ask you to start, but then I'd love to hear how Kosha and Alex are feeling, or I'm gonna call you Rami, I can't call you Kosha, I don't think. Uh, <laughs> so that's, that's actually the critical question, right? I Here's part of, part of my concern. Um, unfortunately, we keep playing this whack-a-mole game of what should we take down, what should we leave up? And I keep pounding my fist on the table about it's the systemic underlying issue. I don't want Mark Zuckerberg to decide what is true and false. I don't want Facebook to be the arbiter of truth. And so we are, there's no question, we're, we're, we're entering a rather dangerous period if we focus too much on who should they deplatform, who should they leave up, because then we're really skating into encroaching on free speech and what does that look like. What I care about is more about the way, the tools, the tools that these companies are providing to people who intentionally want to exploit this situation. I mean, we can go back to 2016. I can give some very current examples as well. But if we go back to 2016, it wasn't that the Russians spread information or tried to you know, use Facebook to inflame tensions just willy nilly. It's that Facebook gave them targeting tools so that they could intentionally target vulnerable communities to create divisions amongst Americans for their greater goal of disrupting our democracy. That's what I want to look at. And, and it's, these, it's this business model of being able to hoover up our human behavioral data to put us in smaller and smaller boxes so that they can perfect this personalization process so that they can sell you sneakers. Well, okay, that's fine. But do we want those same tools that are used to really know when it is that we're ready to buy a pair of sneakers to also decide what political speech I see, which groups I'm recommended into, which who I'm recommended to connect with? I mean, they're, they're the, the QAnon groups. It's not that everybody's going on to Facebook looking for QAnon groups. They're being recommended to you based on whether or not you seem like you're the type of person who'd be interested in QAnon. That is where I think the responsibility lies. And unless we address that, we will forever be in this game of what should they take down? What should they leave up? And that's where we're getting into a more and more dangerous cycle now. Um, I know that's, it's very, it's too much to like really break down quickly, but that's, oh, that's as okay. high level as I could think. I wonder, Alex, you go ahead. It looks like you're ready to jump in. I just wonder how both Alex and Rami as like, you know, really engaged users of these, of these tools, how it has how you've been feeling watching the debate over the guardrails and and watching people use the tools for such ill and what it feels like for you as a as a as a um aficionado yeah i mean the the faces of COVID experience has been uh i think pretty informative to me around i mean i was a, a recreational user of social media but I, I was never really trying to build something um that had real substance to it other than you know me sharing my opinions and i think the uh you know, on one hand, um, and maybe I'll, I'll close with the hopeful piece, the part that scares me, because there is, a, I have, Faces of COVID has actually, in a really weird way, made me more hopeful about social media not being a totally lost cause of toxicity and a cesspool of hate and rage, um, that I do want to talk about that a little bit. But the, you know, I, there's a story that I, keep thinking about. And it was, I posted it very early on in the pandemic because a lot of the stories I'm sourcing from families directly, but a number of them also sourcing from news outlets. And there was a story I had read of a woman uh, who was being interviewed about her son who died of COVID. And it was, um, you know, probably around May or June. 
and her son was 28 years old uh, in Texas. It was a young guy, um, died after a couple of weeks in the hospital. And in the interview, I always read these things start to finish. I watch the television interviews. It was a TV affiliate that was interviewing her, a local one in Texas. And she said in the interview, uh, I'm devastated that my son is gone. Uh, it, our family is never going to be the same. But I think the statistics are a lot of hype and that in a lot of ways, COVID is a hoax. And you think about to be in a position to be um, having lost your child and yet you are so far down. This thing is so much in the grips of you, the conspiracies that you were radicalized with online. I mean, they didn't go to like a local event at the Rotary Club or the Lions Club and somebody said, the statistics are BS. If they did hear it there, it was because somebody saw it on Facebook or Twitter and told them about it, right? And so the, I, the, what I struggle with is how do you even begin to unwind that? It is not just as simple as making the platform disappear. People are already so far down that hole. How do you pull them back? Which interesting is I think Faces of COVID in some ways is a slight tiny little antidote to that because it is much easier to say, oh, that's BS, those stats are BS, and I don't believe that, and that source is BS. But when a, on the other hand, which is what we have a lot of in uh, at Faces of COVID, is a family saying, I'm not here to make a political point. I'm just here to tell you, here is my dad's name. Here's what he loved doing. Here's the day that he died of COVID, and here's a picture of his face. And it is much, much harder, I think, to tell people that that isn't real. You can still do it, people still try, but the hopeful note I wanted to make is that I've been doing Faces of COVID for 10 months, going on 11 months. There have been millions of engagements with individual people in our content. There's 100, almost 150,000 followers of the account right now. I can count on probably one hand the number of trolls that have said COVID is a hoax. The vast majority of replies on every single one. Now I'm probably going to invite them to because I'm sure they all are <laughs> tuning in today. No, I'm just, I'm sure they're not. But they, sometimes I think they just haven't found me yet. But the genuinely, the 99.9% are express of the replies to our posts are expressions of kindness, love, compassion, some of the, the, the things that will renew your faith in humanity that are happening through people's Twitter avatars. I will say one thing, which is that I did experiment with doing faces of COVID on Facebook and it does still exist there, but it, that became a cesspool immediately. Facebook is a different piece of turf than, I mean, Twitter's got its own issues, but um, you know, and so I, I, this has been a really big learning experience for me, but what one of the commenters um, in the chat, I guess we shared her father's uh, or I think her, her loved one's story at some point and having these strangers from all over the country who are replying, you'll never meet them, but there is something affirming about like, what is our view of this country? Are we a place that has, uh, you know, some sense of community and thinks that there's something that we're all in this together or we're not And social media, especially when you're isolated, I think can be really powerful to do that. Um, and so we're, we, I am sort of seeing the Jekyll and Hyde of this uh, in real time. Can I just chime in really quickly on a key point, both to what Alex is saying and to the question in the chat about yelling fire um, in, a, in a public theater or in a movie theater. Here's what people don't realize. I mean, people who don't really follow this issue closely. Part of the reason we are where we are today is that there is absolutely no law that bounds the social media companies in any way to bear any responsibility for any of it. And, and again, you can, I, I wrote a whole piece on it just last week, if you want to get into the nerdy parts of it. But because in 1996, we passed a law called Section 230, which you may have heard Trump tried to get rid of by executive order, that says these companies will bear no responsibility for the, for the content that they host, this is part, part of why we are where we are today. There's another side to Section 230, but that part right there means that whatever happens on Facebook, they can claim it's not their responsibility. And part of where that issue lies is, again, if somebody were to respond to one of Alex's posts about a face of COVID with an obscenity or an anti-Semitic comment or some sort of hate-filled speech or a QAnon person were to dispute it and call it a hoax, 
I don't think Facebook necessarily should be responsible for that individual's post. What they should be responsible for is if they amplify that post or they connect that person to a conspiracy group or they allow someone to actually aid in a bet in, in a crime such as the president calling for insurrection. But they're not because there's no laws governing them. They're the only industry in America that is not governed. So it's more about figuring out what the guardrails are so that the things that Alex are doing can thrive and the things that other people are doing to purposely try to, in, including engage in real world crimes, can, can somebody can be accountable for it. Rami, what, what's your take as a uh, someone, how, how have you experienced this debate uh, kind of swirling around you, uh, around social media and the First Amendment? I'm just trying to like, as of like deplatforming somebody for expression on on um, on the internet, is that kind of what we're? Well, I mean, there's, just, yeah, I think there's increasingly this tension around kind of. I think for many years we've all thought like, is it cool or is it? Can, how do we make? How do we bring the good parts, the faces, well, the posts, whatever, to out? But now think, there's a new level of this debate that really does involve deplatforming. Well, I think like a couple of us, we all have different gigs. So like, I could just like assess like, so like Alex, for instance, is like his regular life. And then he's doing something that's positive, shedding a life on helping people get through the, the realities of COVID. So it's ultimately his choice, whether he chooses to engage with a bunch of trolls without a face that say COVID is a hoax that day, or is he going to choose to like focus on a family and like help that person? And yeah, Elle's situation is different for me. Um, I just, I could give you like just some examples of what's happened to me. Um, you know, I have like people say like, don't you suffer from anti-Semitism? This is the thing because like, if you, anti-Semitism gets a lot of clicks, right? Like maybe for instance, of readers of Forward aren't so interested in the, the track seven of my album or like this specific song. But if there's something that happens, anti-Semitism, it just, draws us in because we, we, we uh, and Alex referred to as doom scrolling, which it was a new word that I didn't realize that I learned till this year. And um, the the thing that these places love, and I've been, I've experienced it, I was hacked by ISIS in 2014. Mm -hmm. um, my website was hacked and it became, and it was at the height of this press run for this terrorist organization, okay, if we might call it that. And what happened is everyone told the story, whatever they wanted to tell and I was included in it. It wasn't like they were covering me, like the forward covers our stuff and we, we talk to them and we, we formulate this interview, right? Um, so what's consistently happening is that like, at, at least in, in my opinion, it's up to me whether I choose to be like the laureate against anti-Semitism and because I could like fish for that um, and it's there all day and it's not gonna go away no matter what I do or no matter how much money I raise for whatever organization that's fighting it because it's just a bunch of, most of the time, it's a bunch of people with a specific, with no face and other times are. And when it is, what there is a face in it and I feel like it's worth it for me to engage at my level of respect of what I've earned for what I've created in my own, in my own genre of work, which is like being a Jewish rapper and being like a pundit on specific things in hip hop. Um, and being asked to comment on, then then I will. But on on the normal times, like if I don't feel like it's worth the fight, unless it's somebody of the highest regard or an A-list celebrity in whatever their field is, and I feel like it's worth speaking out, I'm not gonna engage with it. Just like you won't, just like a journalist won't respond to every single email they get on a pitch. And I, I have to look at it at that because like if I wanna get what I need, my, what I need to do, my work is more valuable than to refer to that. So when all that was happening and like Spotify saying, Donald Trump can't use a Spotify, that was a press thing. Donald Trump doesn't use Spotify. <laughs> so that's a prime example of somebody jumping on the train to promote their thing, right? And oh, you, you can't use this. And you're like, come on guys. Like, you know, McDonald's says you can't come here. Okay, you know, McDonald's, me, I think. I'm gonna, so I just I'm wanted gonna, to put that out there because it's, for me, it's yeah, like, I have I'm to draw the conversation a little bit, but I want to mm -hmm. follow up on something that you said, because you, I referred to you, I think in the introduction and you referred to yourself as a Jewish rapper. And I'm just really interested in, in kind of how that came to be and how you both figured out that hip hop was your medium and that you wanted to be a Jewish hip hop artist. And what does that even mean? And that's, you know, it is a small but growing genre, I suppose. And maybe you can work the story in about how you became Kosha Dills. Okay, well, I'll give you like a short two minute story. So 
I've been rapping since 2020, rapping since 1999. Um, my first friend that taught me how to rap was Persian. Um, I've always had a lot of Israeli pride, but didn't understand much about being Jewish. Um, I was incarcerated for a short bit. I saw a bunch of people getting out of trouble for going to their like religion. They would go to a pastor and they would get space to go see someone when they're incarcerated. So I just demanded to see a rabbi. Or, <laughs> um, and um, I changed my name from Kosher Dill to KD Flow because people made fun of me. And when I came out, my first record was, it was, it was like a, basically like my idea of Jewish representation as like a caricature was like being the Jewish guy in the movie Goodfellas like the kind of sleazy, hardcore Jewish gangster. And that was like, what was tough. Um, there was no other Jewish rappers at the time. Modest, I, didn't, I was doing this before Modest Yahoo existed. So it was a combination of that. And then I, I met Modest Yahoo. So then it was like a spiritual side and a street tough mentality. And that's what Koshi Dills was. It was like sexual and it was like business, like a hustler and it was like hardcore battle rap. And that was what I was inspired by. And it sort of morphed into different things of like Israeli pride and, and Jewish identity and being, you know, proudful, being prideful without having to know anything about being Jewish um, and sort of digging on that. Um, I didn't come from like Jewish day school stuff. It came from just my parents were Israeli and that's it. There was no other Jews in our neighborhood in New Jersey. And that's sort of how that character came out um, of like right. what Kosher Dills is. So that yeah, the, the reason why I becomes Jewish rapper, not a rapper who's a Jewish, because I didn't like really being, I didn't like being Jewish. And now because of the name Kosher Dills, I attract Jewishness. It's like a magnet of like Jewish conversation. I love that. I think one of the things that the three of you all, have, this was, we really are putting these groups together pretty randomly, like what dates work for people and can we make the, does it seem like it'll be fun? And it, it's interesting to me that I think what we've got here, I think you guys are actually all peers. And um, you all have in common really being individuals uh, in, in what you're doing, doing it, you're kind of self-propelled and you're, you're not working in some big organization. I mean, Yale obviously had a, a lot of experience in big organizations, so did Alex, but now really are kind of creating your own brands, creating your own initiatives. And I think doing it without um, that much structure really, right? Like really making your own way. And that's such a, such a, such a, internet digital thing to do. It's such a modern thing to do. It's a young thing to do. I'd love you to reflect on that or does that, uh, is, is how that resonates for you? Um, and and what the, what's the key to making that happen um, and, and being able to sustain it? Like, you know, Alex, if you decide tomorrow not to do face of COVID, like people might be mad, but like, whatever, you can just stop. But you're not, I don't know, talk to us a little bit about being that, that one man band or one person band. Yeah, um, you know, I, I think, I, I have the benefit of having spent most of my professional career in the communication space. And, um, you know, I usually, it's very been a really weird year because for the, you know, 10 or 15 professional years leading up to this, usually my responsibility was to be the person behind the scenes, like whispering in somebody else's ear and giving them their talking points and, you know, briefing them on whatever the issues were. And then one thing I did not expect was that Faces of COVID actually got a, like a real avalanche of media coverage. And uh, suddenly I'm, you know, doing interviews on with the Washington Post and MSNBC. And I had not really, you know, I'd done a lot of local political punditry here in Massachusetts, but, um, you know, it was the first time I felt like people actually wanted to talk to me personally. And um, the, and the strangest part is the context in which I've been put in that position, which is as a, you know, in some ways like um, to be put in this position to be the expected person to tell us of 10 people each day who died. Like what a, like I could have never imagined that lane for myself. Um, but at the same time, I also think that one of the, I, I've believed for a really long time that the, when, we, when we talk about all the issues that Yale beautifully laid out around what's like kind of ripping us apart and why social media just exploits the broken fabric of our communities better than almost anything you could imagine. Um, I think that one of the reasons we're there is because empathy has like totally drained out of every single thing. You, you win points on social media for being not empathetic right, for being as sort of dismissive and uh, trolling or whatever, um, you know, and I think what I sort of 
through this process of phases of COVID seen as my contribution to like what I want to do with this next phase of my life and to use this as a tool is to say, how do we inject empathy back into the way in which we, how do we see each other again, right? Like the, the thing about phases of COVID, this is not some crazy formula to get people to pay attention to the pandemic. It's a picture of somebody who's gone, right? It's the most basic means of connecting, which is through the loss of somebody else. And um, and by the way, I, I will say that just from a personal, like, you know, connecting things back to, you know, Kosher gave his sort of Jewish story and my Jewish story is like, I had the most like stereotypical Jewish upbringing you could imagine in Newton, Massachusetts. I went to Brandeis, I lived in Coolidge Corner. Like I had the Jewish pedigree that uh, is almost a, sort of like, um, you know, joked about, but I, um, in this experience, I've actually connected with the Jewishness of my life because I think the way in which the Jewish community approaches death is a, I, I, what I've learned over the years is a lot about being present with it and not d pretending that nothing happened, right? Like that we actually force ourselves to interface with loss. And so I've, it's actually been an experience of feeling like maybe even a little more connected uh, with my Judaism than I have traditionally, um, which I think is just sort of an interesting, unexpected uh, takeaway from this experience. Yeah, Elle, I saw you nodding when I was talking about, you know, becoming a, a, a one woman show, one woman band. And I wonder if you can talk about that just the kind of transition and how, you, how you've now built this democracy activist life for yourself. Yeah, I, it's definitely not something that was ever the plan. Um, similar to Alex. I mean, I spent my life being, you know, a person behind the scenes. And that's generally where I'm actually quite happy. I'm all about getting things done. And I don't really care if I'm the face of it, which might seem funny now because my face is everywhere. But um, that wasn't what I set out for. What started it, I'll take you back to 2016. I mean, I had... I'd, for me, um, I think my parents are watching right now. They, they will emphatically nod when I say this. I, I, am, <laughs> I am the type of person who's gonna stand up and fight for what I believe in. And um, in 2015, when things released, when that civil discourse started breaking down here, and, and again, remember the first part of my career, I, I, I'm a former CIA officer. Like I never planned to go public with that. I never planned to speak out publicly. But when that started happening, and I, my first piece I ever wrote publicly was in Time, and it was about actually speaking of empathy. It, it, it's actually the core of the TED Talk five years later about the breakdown in our ability to speak to each other and to empathize with each other. And, um, but sorry, long story short, what really kind of broke out into this one woman show that I've been flailing around in lately is, <laughs> If you all recall on, um, not to get super political, but this is my story. Um, you might recall that the very first thing President Trump did on day one was to give a speech at the CIA in front of the wall of stars. And I hadn't spoken publicly about my past yet. And that, it, it, everything about that speech showed me exactly everything that was, to, was going to come. And so I wrote the New York Times op-ed about, um, Trump's speech at the CIA and a star on the wall behind him that represented my dead colleague. And that sort of blasted me into my friends. Most people never knew I was in the CIA to front page of the New York Times online, everyone knowing it. And for the last four years, I'm gonna be frank, it's been a struggle. I'm, I like being part of a team. I am very mission oriented and have struggled since leaving government to really find the same mission and purpose as I had in government. Um, but I will keep fighting and more and more, obviously, as we've seen over the last four years, to me, I believe the fight was worth it. The problem is it's difficult because everybody thinks because I'm fighting for democracy, it's like a charity thing that I should do out of the kindness of my heart as a public service. I won't say it pays the rent. I'm going to be real frank. It doesn't. Um, but I can go to sleep at night knowing that I wasn't going to be silent in the face of what I saw as a true danger to our country. Um, Hopefully I'll be part of a team again someday. Now that, now, that, now that as of tomorrow, I might feel like now it's time to figure out how to really build that bridge and rebuild civil right. discourse. Um, the goal in life is not to flail around and brand. I will say this, you said about brand. I mean, the only thing about my brand is I have been 100% authentic and spoken my mind, including it 
pretty much risk to myself. I've pissed off Mark Zuckerberg and Donald Trump. Um, so I guess that's my brand that I, I don't, I, I that's don't a great brand. That. Yeah. Empathy <laughs> and authenticity are two of my big, uh, principles. So that's a lot of how you ended up on the forward 50. Um, Rami, I know you need to go soon. So I'm going to start. You yeah. You. Well, I have a little bit more time actually. I, I arranged, okay, but, great. Mm. I want to, take what you guys were just both both um alex and yale specifically were talking a lot about kind of the ways that their work in 2020 might kind of change their future trajectory work-wise but i, I want to get a little more personal i feel like all of us so many people i know myself it's like so this whole mess of things happened in 2020 particularly the pandemic and the and the lockdowns around the country but then obviously also the racial reckoning the intensity of the political campaign which was so polarizing um but in particularly the pandemic and the restrictions that it that it imposed i just think caused a lot of us to really rethink restructure, redo, reinvent the way we do so many things in our lives. And there have been, at least for me and for me that I know, like a number of silver linings to that experience. Um, finding out that, you know, ways to spend time with your family or the glory of walking around your neighborhood or whatever it is. And I would love for each of you to t share um, how some parts of your personal life have changed, some adjustments you made that you want to hold on to, things that you're going to take with you after you're vaccinated and maybe keep um, lessons learned from this experience that you think are valuable and that you hope yourself or any organization you're involved in, ways of ways of working that have changed that you're gonna try to keep um, for, with, rather than going back all the way into our sort of the insanity in some ways of some of the consumer culture we were all caught up in. So I'll start with you, Rami. Okay, cool. Um, one, I was just, just wanna add to what, yeah, it's so funny that, uh, yeah, else and 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 also Alex have been always working for organizations. I've never worked for anyone else in my life. I think I worked at a rehab and sober sixteen years. So I like worked at a rehab maybe over ten years ago, and I've just been doing the Kosher Deals project. So I don't I don't have experience of what it's like to work for other people. Um, I think this year was like the first time I was like, oh, it would be so cool to like get a job. You know, I thought about that, and uh, I didn't follow through on that. I just kept working for myself, but. Uh, the interesting thing is right when the um, right after APAC, I went and I ran a marathon this year and I barely trained for it. I kind of ran it to like prove something to another girl and uh, I did it. And I really took that as such a lesson as that, like I'm, I'm, I'm extremely resilient and able to endure like long ter term periods of like pain. So when everyone else was like in the mode of suffering, I'm like, OK, this is my time that my the way my life is like rolled out on the carpet in front of us all is like, this will be the odd time for me to capitalize on and to really build momentum. Um, I wanna take like, I, I feel like extremely more resilient and pa I learned a lot about patience um, and not to take things personal. Like for instance, people don't contact you back. People don't get around to calling you. People that you like don't like you because um, I'm single so I'm just like oh you know I all those th things start coming out and you and it's not uh if you don't take things personal you can't really be affected by it and it's like that simple although it's way harder to accept that is something that I've been trying to like put into practice um and so that way when I contact everyone and I don't get booked or I contact people and they don't hit me back that's not my issue <laughs> so that's what and, and that also goes back to the deplatforming of the social media, I, I felt like that wasn't my issue because I really wasn't, I don't use it in a negative way. So I didn't want to devote all my emotional energy to that when I could be doing something that could be so much more helpful, like what Alex is doing or what Yale's doing. So um, patience, resilience, that's what I'm taking into 2021. Nice. <clears throat> Alex? That was a great answer. Uh, you know, I, I think there's there's two things that are going to stick with me after this. I think one on a personal level is that um, I think that all of us to some extent got unbelievably good at being really, really busy without actually accomplishing that much. And uh, <laughs> I have like I look back on what life was like, uh, you know, a couple you know months before the pandemic and you know, I was going a mile a minute and, uh, you know, 
but like thinking that I was accomplishing a lot when I was in a lot of ways, sometimes just kind of standing in the same spot. Um, I've spent most of my married life in pandemic. And so when your world gets much smaller and uh, it's me and my wife and my dog um, and the, my parents a mile away, and that's basically the whole bubble, um, you know, it, it really does allow you to recalibrate a little bit. I think what I've struggled with, and this is where, you know, I think I need to think about what this means long term, is that sometimes I feel I'm so busy with work right now. I have my own company. We've got tons of clients. We're doing climate change work and all kinds of, you know, equity issues, economic empowerment. It's all really powerful stuff. But sometimes I sit here on my back porch and I'm working on Zoom calls all day long. And I feel like I'm playing some change the world video game where like I have the luxury of just closing my laptop when I need to. And I'm really struggling with that. Um, I think that the, you know, to do all the work that you care about, but do it virtually when I'm used to being physically in person, I think has been really hard. And I can already feel this narrative that's gonna to start to take hold, the end of the Trump era, the uh, hopefully the pandemic taking a turn for, you know, the to slow down a little bit, is that you're gonna to start to hear all this conversation and narrative around going back to normal. And I think that we really need to scrutinize what normal was and normal for whom, because I think that for millions and millions of people in this country, normal has been a devastating catastrophe for decades. And if there's one thing I've learned of this is that I sort of have the luxury to step aside from that and to view it academically or you know, as the problem I solve on my computer. But this pandemic has literally ripped open every single disparity that has been growing for decades. And I got bad news for my friends who are Democrats and progressives, which is this started long before Donald Trump and we all have culpability in this. And what do we do with that? What do we do with the fact that the communities that have been hit hardest by this pandemic are the same communities that for decades have experienced environmental injustice, lack of access to health care, food insecurity, poverty, uh, brutality and policing, all of these types of issues have come to bear and we've seen them. We've got an opportunity now. We've seen in the pandemic, it has forced us to pay attention to it, hopefully maybe a little more than we were before. And I think we can't just kind of like revert to the way things were. It's like when you, you know, hear something from a friend and it's this really crazy story and you're like, I am never going to look at you quite the same way. Like we can't look at the world the same way that we did in January of 2020. And I think that's like, that's a real big thing to wrestle with and something that I know I'll be, I'll be wrestling with for a while. Really well put. Yeah, I, I'm guessing that Brixton might be a pandemic puppy. So that may be one of your silver linings, but He's an elections puppy. I got him just before the election. <laughs> He's the one who made all the difference. That's funny. I'll answer this really quickly since Great. I think we only have one minute left. Um, similar to, first of all, I want to make sure that Rami noticed that there's an offer to introduce you to somebody's daughter in the chat. So I want to make sure that you see that. Um, but similar to everyone else, I've scaled back dramatically the, the, who, who is the friend circle? Who do you see? I mean, you can only see people who are within a few blocks of you now. Um, prioritize, you know, what are your priorities? All the same things that these guys have been talking about. Um, what I hope for, for more public facing in addition to what Alex said, cause that's exactly what I'm on my soapbox about. I also kind of hope we rethink what it means, like what, what, a public service mindset means and what civic engagement means. Because I think part of the problem also was that so many Americans got very used to life is convenient. I don't have to actually work for it. I don't have to work for our democracy. I don't have to work for our security. I can just keep on doing whatever is convenient and easy for me. And I do hope that uh, moving forward, there's a little bit more of a civic minded and public service mindset. I, I, I know it won't be for everybody, but even if it's just for a small portion of the country, um, I'm, I'm hopeful that that could also help uh, move things forward. Thank you for that, Yael and uh, Rami, Kosha and Alex. It's been just great having you with us. Thank you to everybody who joined and stuck with us for the hour. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. You will get in your email tomorrow um, a summary, a video, some links, and we hope you'll share the, the link to the video um, of this chat with your friends and followers if they'd be interested. Um, we uh, invite you to join us for next week's 
uh, Forward 50 Zoom and, and to keep in touch with all of our events where, where we've got one coming up actually on white supremacy and um, anti-Semitism is January 6th, the beginning or the end, um, or maybe it's neither, um, but there's lots of, uh, lots of events and lots of great journalism on forward.com. You will, as I said, get in your email an offer for a discounted subscription. So thank you to our panelists. Thank you to our audience. And thanks especially to our um, team putting on these events, Lisa Lepson, Gabby Brooks, and Dina Cooperman. Um, take care. Have a good Tuesday. Good luck, everybody, with the inauguration, whatever your role is watching on TV or on your phone or whatever. Stay safe. Be well. And um, thank you for supporting the forward. Thank you.